Thank you for joining us for another segment of Diplomacy Classroom. I'm Lauren Fisher with the National Museum of American Diplomacy, and I am particularly excited about hosting today's program, which focuses on the global issue combating wildlife trafficking. Joining us to help us better understand this important issue, we have two State Department diplomats, Dr. Rowena Watson and Leslie Catherwood. Rowena and Leslie, who will join us shortly, come from two main teams within the State Department which focus on combating wildlife trafficking. So no doubt our discussion will enlighten all of us more about the issue. But before we get started, I want to invite all of you are, who are tuning in today to follow the National Museum of American Diplomacy on all our social media platforms at NAMAD Museum. That way you can receive notices of upcoming programs. So we'd love to be in touch with you. We will be taking some questions at the conclusion of the presentations. So feel free to put your, drop your questions in the comment box. The mission of the National Museum of American Diplomacy is to explore with our audiences uh, the history, the challenges, the practice of American diplomacy through our exhibits, our artifacts, and our programs such as this. But it's also to help our audiences better understand the function and the role of our US diplomats abroad and the State Department and how our diplomats engage on global issues. Well, and today's program is, is certainly in alignment with that mission. We're gonna explore the global issue of wildlife trafficking and how our diplomats engage in that issue, why it's important and how it impacts us here at home. Uh, to complement today's discussion, I want all of you to be aware that the museum also has some resources on our website that uh, further explore this idea or, or this the, um, the issue of wildlife trafficking. So I'm just going to share my screen for a moment so I can take you to our homepage. This is the homepage of the National Museum of American Diplomacy. You see the view of our diplomacy is our mission exhibit on view in our museum. And I'm first going to drop you to our resources at a glance, which is under the education tab. And here in one spot, if you have an interest in exploring more the role of the State Department, what we do, the role of diplomats abroad, you can find that information here. We also have some videos, as you see on the right, which explore why our diplomats work abroad and how that their work impacts us here at home. And then we also have some videos that explore global issues and you see some global issues here. Um, these are shorter uh, video clips and these videos in fact uh, complement our diplomacy simulation program. And if you go back up to that education tab and you see our simulation program, here we have um, 10 hypothetical simulations that allow uh, participants to step into that role of a diplomat and and get a first-hand look at the struggle and the challenge of negotiating and solving problems. Um, the focus here is a, 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 of global issues. Here you do, you do see that we have an international wildlife trafficking simulation. So the information that we will explore today with our guests will certainly complement this simulation. This program will be recorded and will be posted on our website. So as you explore the content with your students and perhaps consider doing a simulation, you have this video to consult um, as background to the issue. All right, so I'm gonna go back and without further delay, I would like to invite to the screen our first guest, Dr. Rowena Watson. Rowena, are you there? Oh, hey, how you doing? Great, hi. Hi, Rowena, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, sure. So you work in the State Department's Office of Conservation and Water in the Bureau of Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs. Now, I know that's a mouthful, but I think it's really important for our audiences to realize that the State Department, State Department has a whole bureau dedicated to focusing on some of these issues. And okay. with, yeah, absolutely. And so within your job, you focus on policy and also 
diplomacy efforts, which means you work with U.S. embassies abroad, as well as with US, other U.S. federal agencies. So you are the perfect person to help us better understand this issue of combating wildlife trafficking. So I now turn it over to you to help us, Thank you know, enlighten us. Fantastic. It's really nice to join you guys. Thank you so much for asking us to join Diplomacy Classroom. This is the first one that we've done. And so we hope that we are inspiring and reaching a lot of you folks out there tuning in for Diplomacy Classroom and that we'll get some of your questions answered through the presentation and also through the chat. So we can get started with my slides, please. Yep, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. Perfect. Okay, awesome. So. Um, as mentioned, I'm with the state um, OES Bureau in the Conservation and Water Office, and I am the team lead for wildlife conservation and combating wildlife trafficking. And one of our main teams that we also work with is Leslie's team, who you'll hear from soon. So OES and INL work really closely together at the State Department, and the State Department actually does a tremendous amount of work on combating wildlife trafficking and has for many years working with our embassies, working with interagency partners, working with NGOs and outside experts and the scientific community. So I have to say it is a fantastic job and we are definitely making a difference. Let me get into some of the basics for you on combating wildlife trafficking. So first of all, defining wildlife trafficking. This is pretty important for the, for the US as well because we do all kinds of international negotiating with treaties and language on what are the rules um, across different countries for what does it mean to traffic in wildlife. So here's, here's a definition that um, we've come up with. It's the poaching or illegal take, taking of protected or managed species and the illegal trade in wildlife and their related parts and products. So this is important because this isn't only endangered species like you hear about the IUCN red list if something's threatened or endangered. Uh, this is also protected species so something might be illegal for trade or consumption because it is from a protected forest or protected habitat. So wildlife trafficking we also include in that that in our definition of poaching transit and so the illegal transport of it after it's already dead and of course on the import and consumption end of it. And I want to make one more distinction here before I get to my next slide, which is that there is a large amount of legal wildlife trade. So um, sometimes people talk about and the wildlife trade, and there's quite a bit of legal wildlife trade. The United States has a large pet trade. I, I'm sure many of you have pets and have been to PetSmart and see things, some things like birds and reptiles for sale. They are legal or, or they're supposed to be legal. So there's a, a big legal trade and we work on illegal trade and combating the trafficking. So um, how do we do this? There are so many ways that wildlife trafficking um, that we approach this depending on who we're working with. But this is also over the years through, especially through USG leadership, this has been taken from a small piece of a wildlife conservation problem to really a national security threat and framing this as transnational organized crime and understanding the implications of wildlife trafficking um, and the criminals who, who operate in, in this realm. So here's some, some points for us to consider. So um, this top point is something that we talk about quite a bit, that it threatens national security, undermines economic prosperity, so hurts those countries that are trying to have uh, livelihoods that are legal with their natural resources, of course, fuels corruption, undermines the rule of law, it's breaking laws, and spreads disease. I'll talk a little bit about disease later. Um, for many years, there was uh, wildlife trafficking was characterized by very high profits and very small penalties. So your criminals know they don't care about what they're trafficking in as long as they're making money. And they're gonna get in a lot less trouble for trafficking wildlife, which might even be confusing to some officials because it's not clear if it's legal or illegal. And so there are small penalties, maybe the, the criminal justice system in their country doesn't even know how to prosecute wildlife crime. So these are all things that we've had to overcome and work, and work on um, in our efforts on working on wildlife trafficking globally. Um, I, it's also a, a highly lucrative crime estimated at five to 23 billion 
annually. It's very hard to get numbers on a, on a black market trade, but suffice it to say, it's a big number. It's worth, it generates a lot of criminal proceeds. And of course, very importantly for the United States, uh, very strong bipartisan congressional support for combating wildlife trafficking. And this has been true for many years. And, um, and, and, we, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of our policy uh, legislative pieces of legislation that we use later. Okay, next slide. Um, so what, what are people using this stuff for? I think some of us see these things in the news. There's, there's whole animals, live animal trade. There's food animal, animals being used for their parts and product. Uh, products. There is the exotic pet trade. There's home decor and furnishings. So it's this is another reason why it's been very difficult to build capacity for understanding this crime because it comes in all kinds of shapes, forms, and sizes, and different trade routes, and um, has many many destinations. Next slide, please. Good. I was hoping that slide was there. So this indeed is a global issue. Um, our office works with our embassies and foreign governments all over the world. Of course, there are some regional trends for different products. And, um, but this map is from a recent UNODC World Wildlife Crime Report that was published um, a few months ago and um, just showing some, some of the trade routes, but it's simp simply to say that this is very much a global issue involving um, natural resources, and protected species all over the world. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Mentioned some of this earlier. Um, these are some of our kind of top line messages that we use to fit into our policy priorities and how we approach this topic uh, from a diplomacy standpoint. So um, these are very serious concerns in countries uh, uh, that we work with about corruption across the board, undermining the rule of law. Um, a couple things to point out here, endangers park rangers and civilian populations. So there's in some cases quite a bit of um, violence and threats to uh, people trying to protect their natural resources and uh, also spreads disease. This is something that the United States has been talking about for quite a while, that there's a real risk from zoonotic diseases from, uh, from illegal wildlife consumption and wildlife trafficking. So uh, I will touch on that in a few slides later. Next slide, please. As I said about that we have strong bipartisan support, we also have a whole of government approach that is really a model for other countries. So I'm just gonna, these bullets here are just for things that people can look, look up later or just mentioning some ways that we have umbrellas for working on wildlife trafficking and some major policies. So of course we have the 2016 End Wildlife Trafficking uh, Act from Congress and, and the State Department puts out a report every year, uh, sends a report to Congress and the 2020 report is being released this month. Uh, we, in this administration, we got a big boost for working on uh, wildlife trafficking in Executive Order 13773, which uh, specifically names wildlife trafficking amongst the hmm. uh, and amongst the areas that we really have to focus on for looking at transnational criminal organizations and preventing international trafficking. And then I think my next slide is about the task force, which is my mm -hmm. top bullet, yes. So as mentioned, the US has a really a tremendous whole of government approach, which a lot of other countries uh, use this, our, our approach as a model. So basically this means that um, instead of having you know one ministry or one the environment ministry or just a small part of the judicial system or a small part of the State Department work on wildlife trafficking um, internationally, we have a 17th federal agency task force that's co-chaired by the State Department, the Department of Interior, the Department of Justice, and USAID. So um, we really talk to each other. Um, we work on, that's why we're so successful with our um, leveraging the power of our embassies and our ambassadors with our investigations and our judicial process. So that's just a quick slide on, on the task force. Okay, couple things here um, before I hand over to Leslie. I said I was gonna mention about the zoonotic diseases. So, one thing, there's a lot of talk about coronavirus. One thing that we do know about coronavirus and Ebola and HIV and SARS is that the pathogens 
the, the genetic sequence and the pathogens themselves, they, those came from wildlife. And that's, so one of the threats that the United States has talked about for a long time about wildlife trafficking is it increases the risks for spreading zoonotic diseases and creating pandemics. So in the COVID context, there's a lot of attention to zoonotic diseases and wildlife trafficking and high risk wildlife markets. And so we are working with partners in multilateral conversations and with other countries to talk about what needs to change in cracking down much more seriously because of health security concerns about wildlife trafficking, as well as um, how, how are, so not just the illegal trade, but also some of these things are high risk and bad practices as well. So there's a health security angle and there's also a law enforcement angle that we are working with our partners on. And my next slides, I think just support um, they're giving a visual that, so this is Southeast Asia and China. Um, these are not standards or practices that the United States uh, has. These, the United States has very, very different regulations, health regulations and practices, frankly, having to deal with, with wildlife consumption and markets. So this is something we're working with our embassies. Next slide, please. All over the world to talk about what are the risks from wildlife trafficking and consumption that we really need to raise the bar on the zoonotic disease concerns. Okay, I think- so, Yeah, those are some powerful images there for sure to look at that. Um, yeah. Before I bring Leslie to the screen though, I, I would like to just kind of ask you a question because you mentioned this as a national security issue and certainly yeah. in the context of uh, a, a virus uh, transferred to a human from an animal, as you mentioned, it's certainly, um, a, you, you know, our audience can understand as a security issue, but are, is there another aspect of our national security that the wildlife trafficking kind of impacts that perhaps we don't see as just a common person? I mean, it's clearly a virus is something that we can understand, but is there other aspects of our national security that this impacts? Let me see if, I'm, if I've got your question right and you can tell me if I don't. But I, I think one of the things that we, one of the reasons why we have so much support for working on wildlife trafficking is it's one of these crimes that gets, goes under the radar. So there's a lot of corruption, there's a lot of money. So money. there's a lot of money that transnational criminal networks and other pockets of criminality are, are gaining without serious penalties without getting caught. And so it's basically fueling corruption and criminal networks. So that it's funding for all of, all of those activities that those, those types of, of people are engaged in. Thank you, you, yeah, that was, that was what I was wondering. Okay, so we're gonna keep the slides up, but I'm gonna invite Leslie Catherwood to the screen. Hi, Leslie, how are you? Hi, good, thank uh, you. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us. Now, you work on a different aspect of this issue where Dr. Watson works on sort of the policy and diplomacy and working with our embassies. You work on the law enforcement side of it. And I just wanna mention where you work. You, are in, you work in the State Department's Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs and in an office called Global Programs and Policy. So again, it's really interesting to know that a State Department has um, a bureau dedicated to international narcotics and law enforcement. And in the State Department, we say your portfolio, right? Your portfolio is wildlife trafficking in Asia. So that's where you sort of put your attention. So thank you for joining us and help us understand sort of what this law enforcement means and how you, how you work in that area. Absolutely, thank you so much, Lauren, and thank you, Rowena. Um, as folks mentioned, I do work in a bureau with a very long name. We, we go by INL for short. And in a nutshell, INL works to counter crime. And we work on a wide variety of crime issues, including drug trafficking, corruption, money laundering, cybercrime, wildlife trafficking, and more. And we have a wide range of tools that we use to counter these various forms of crime, including foreign assistance programs, diplomacy, sanctions, 
engagement in international fora, such as the United Nations and more. Next slide. All right. But the reason why INL works to counter all these different crime areas, including wildlife trafficking, is to combat transnational organized crime, or TOC for short, T-O-C. Next slide. Now, these criminal groups are using the same networks and the same routes to traffic a wide variety of products, such as people, drugs, guns, timber, wildlife, and more. And as Rowena mentioned, to a certain extent, talk doesn't care what commodities they sell as long as it makes a profit. So I wanna take a moment here and make two important points about wildlife trafficking. The first is that wildlife trafficking is perpetrated by transnational criminal networks. We are not talking about poor people hunting for subsistence. This is about well-organized, well-financed criminal organizations who are poaching and trafficking products on a global commercial scale. Next slide. And the second point is that wildlife trafficking could not happen without corruption. Corruption is absolutely essential for wildlife trafficking. And unfortunately, we're talking about corruption at all levels from permitting to customs and other law enforcement through all levels of government and the private sector. Next slide. So that's a lot. And the way INL attempts to tackle all of these various issues is by managing foreign assistance programs to combat wildlife trafficking. In other words, we provide funding to organizations with operations in those countries where wildlife trafficking is most prevalent. And those organizations in turn provide capacity building programs. Now, the term capacity building is a favorite buzzword in this field. And what it means in our case is that we're working to increase a country's ability to combat wildlife trafficking. To do that, we work with a variety of implementers to provide our programs, including other U.S. government agencies, such as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Office of Law Enforcement, NGOs, and international organizations such as UNODC. Now, as was previously mentioned, because we are the Bureau of International Law Enforcement Affairs, we focus on the issue of wildlife trafficking exclusively from a criminal justice or law enforcement angle. So we don't work on conservation focused activities such as conservation breeding, habitat management, park management, and the like. Instead, what we do do is we work with the entire justice sector to improve their ability to combat wildlife crime in their country. So we have four priority areas for all of our programs to combat wildlife trafficking. Next slide. The first area is to improve the interdiction of illegal wildlife products. And our goal here is to improve the ability of frontline law enforcement officers to intercept illegal wildlife products en route to their destinations. And I have to admit, it's surprising how frequently an officer's conducting a search of a vehicle or a shipping container or other means of conveyance, they see a wildlife product, but put it back in that vehicle because it's not drugs and all they're looking for is drugs. So our goal here under this activity is to increase awareness of wildlife crime, improve identification of wildlife products, and therefore increase the seizure rates of illegal wildlife goods. Next slide. Our second priority area is to build the investigative and enforcement functions of frontline law enforcement officers. And I would consider this to be really the core of our work and that's to improve the ability of frontline officers to fully investigate wildlife crime. Now I'm using the word frontline very purposefully here because what we mean is whoever is the first one at that crime scene. So that could be customs, 
it could be a park ranger, it could be national police, whoever's the first at that crime scene, we provide a variety of training options from introductory law enforcement skills through advanced techniques to help those frontline officers be even more adept at their job. So the training topics include things like how to properly secure a crime scene, how to process evidence, how to conduct controlled deliveries, gather intelligence, the use of forensics and other technologies, and more. Next slide. Our third priority area for programming is to enhance the prosecutorial and judicial capacity in those countries. So here we're looking to increase the ability of prosecutors and judges to properly prosecute and hopefully convict wildlife criminals to the fullest extent of the law. Because even if we do the world's best job at training the law enforcement officers under priority area number two, if the prosecutors don't know all the ins and outs and peculiarities of trying a wildlife crime case, then the case could get thrown out of court on a technicality mm. and the criminal goes free. Mm -hmm. And then we've lost all of that really great work. So what we really need to do is ensure that everyone in the entire justice sector chain is familiar with this crime, understands the laws, and that the criminals are prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law in that country. Next slide. And then our fourth priority area for programming is to develop cross-border cooperation. And here we really serve as a liaison to help build relationships across borders. So for example, let's say the Thailand Customs makes a huge seizure at the Bangkok airport. Do those customs officers know who to contact back in Kenya where that shipment originated? Maybe, maybe not. So what we do is we help to build both formal and informal relationships between those agencies so that they can communicate and cooperate to fully investigate this crime. Next slide. So really here, our overarching goal for all of our programs and all of these activities is to reverse what is currently a low risk, high reward criminal activity and turn it into a high risk, low oh. reward one. Next slide. Because then we're not only stopping the slaughter of protected species, but also taking down organized crime. And that is a critical step towards advancing security, economic prosperity, and stability across the world. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. And this is like a perfect example of diplomacy at work, where it's about building relationships, both on our side, on the US government side, but also abroad, so we can together make this everybody's issue, so we can, we can stop the, the trafficking. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. All right. Excellent. And we do have some questions. So we do have some time and we have some great questions that have been populating um, the box. Um, let me see. The one that comes that I'd like to start with is, this is from Jennifer H. Hello. Is there a difference between wildlife trafficking and wildlife smuggling? You want to take that, Rowena? Sure, I can let Leslie add to it. So trafficking legally is a term for us that actually denotes that it's serious crime and that means something in policy for to say trafficking. Smuggling is a part of the, the trade route. So smuggling is sort of like poaching as part of trafficking. Smuggling, it has to do with its illegal transportation. Leslie, do you have anything to pitch in on that? just that they are definitely related and smuggling is a component of wildlife trafficking. So when I was talking about the interdiction of illegal wildlife products, that's really the smuggling component of it. It's the transit and concealment of those products en route to their destination. So the two are inextricably linked, yes. 
you both have described like so many dimensions to this work. Um, but the, the next question kind of gets at you to maybe talk about the most important approach. What is the most important approach to stopping wildlife trafficking? Education, sort of like the citizens or policy government? Certainly training is in there as well in terms of what Leslie describes as us working with other governments to train their, their, their law enforcement officers. Okay, so, um, so of course that question depends on who you ask, but since we're asking the State Department, um, so from a State Department perspective, we use a number of different policies and tools, but the one that I'll mention here is the, the National Strategy for, for Combating Wildlife Trafficking. So there's three components to that. It's law enforcement, which um, Leslie's group, INL, and, all, and a lot of other branches of the USG, um, like Fish and Wildlife Service law enforcement uh, attends to the law enforcement piece of it, which is huge. Um, then there's also um, demand reduction, which is sort of, I think was rolled into that question about um, changing behaviors and campaigns. And so we do, the State Department does a little bit of that. We have something called zoo hackathons and we have social media campaigns and we work with our embassies. But um, in terms of the USG, that's, that's another thing that we do. Demand reduction is part of our national strategy. And then the big thing that the State Department does, and that's where we really drive policy and um, hopefully get high level commitment from various leaders and get mandates um, that we can allow for others to perform on, under those mandates is the international cooperation. So international cooperation, law enforcement and demand reduction is the national strategy. And then we work on that from all those different angles. But in terms of what is the most important, I mean, cert I guess if you're asking, we're driving policy and making sure that there's high level commit political commitment. So there's a law under which to pr investigate, prosecute and perform law enforcement. Do you want to add yeah. to that, Leslie? Are you okay? No, that oh, was great. Oh, sure. No, Rowena covered it. And yeah. unfortunately, I was going to say this, this crime area and this issue is so complex, it really is important that we attack it from all angles yeah. and that you have to have strong policies and laws in place in order for the law enforcement to do their job. And so the two, again, are very closely linked. And that's why I feel as though the State Department has a very holistic, comprehensive program to combat wildlife trafficking, where we are looking at it from all of those different levels, both the law and policy, law enforcement, and demand reduction. You have to have all of those components to really affect change. Excellent. Awesome. All right. What do you have to do to convince another country or government to work and commit to this issue? How do you motivate them? Right. Well, that's a great question. Um, so depending on where we are and what multilateral negotiation or what meeting we're in, that we spend a lot of time and effort working on that. So there's a couple different things that we would do. Um, a, a couple, one example is that we worked on getting um, countries to ban their domestic ivory trade for years and to stop having a huge uh, consumption of ivory because there was so much ivory trafficking um, going around the world. And we worked really hard with China to get them to, um, through diplomatic engagements, the, the US and China a few years ago, both imposed their own domestic ivory bans. So we have what's called a near total domestic ivory ban, which is technicality for small antiques and things. But um, so some of that was the international community's outrage at the transnational organized crime and ivory trafficking and where it was going. So there was political pressure, there was diplomatic pressure, there was also media and NGO reporting. So there was a lot of different efforts that went into that. And I think putting them all together and packaging them and, and going to the governments in the right international fora or under the right circumstances for either a bilateral conversation or a regional conversation, um, something that that the U.S. has been really strong about is um, uh, tiger trafficking. So that's an international issue that all international trade in tigers is illegal. And we're trying to get some countries to shut down their, um, their domestic tiger farms and, and breeding tigers for consumption for TCM. Um, so that's a work in progress. The pangolins is another issue. So I think that there's a lot of different things that come together. And once again, uh, the U.S. is really a leader in 
picking up on what is an emerging issue and what's something that we need to get people behind. And then, and then we see what our opportunities are and, all, and, and sort of a lot of different circumstances, bringing the information together, the reporting, the, the public outreach, and then whatever's the policy opportunity. Excellent. You mentioned a lot of tools in there in the museum. And as we work with students, we, we talk a lot about the tools that diplomats use to do their work. And you mentioned, you know, sort of applying that pressure, the political pressure using the media. Of course, there's the negotiation. Um, so thank you for mentioning those really specific tools at your disposal that you use to to move the needle forward. Leslie, is there anything you wanted to add to that? No, just to capitalize on what Rowena said is that when we're talking about what message works in a particular country, that it is not a one size fits all message. That mm -hmm. it's really important to tailor that message to your audience. And in this case, that particular government. So the message that works in Africa might not work in Asia. Mm -hmm. For example, audience. Africa um, has a huge portion of their economy relying on ecotourism. So in Africa, it's very important that we still enable and support local communities to benefit from their natural resources. Whereas in Asia, sometimes talking about maybe an anti-corruption component to this work really resonates with that government. So just to mention that it's really, it depends on who you're talking to, unfortunately. And part of our job at the State Department is to understand who we're talking to and what what are the issues and messages that are important to them? Great. Can you, here's another question. Um, what animals are most trafficked? Leslie might be better at this one than me. I mean, I think um, I'll, take a, I'll take a shot here. Um, uh, the, the pangolin is the most highly trafficked mammal and the, the volume is sort of mind blowing about that. Um, so if you're talking about weight or individuals that are poached, so then, of course, it depends on the size of the animal. But off the top of my head, um, it's uh, pangolins, uh, ivory, rhino horn. Um, and what else would I? What else would I put? Wow. What else is on that list for like top ten? We, we play this fun yeah. fun game. <laughs> Leslie, you want to chime in there? Sure. So unfortunately, this is not one of the top ten lists that you want to be on. Unfortunately, as Rowena said. The pangolin is the most heavily trafficked mammal in the entire world. Most people don't know what a pangolin is, but I encourage you to look it up if you're not familiar. Of course, elephants and rhinoceroses are also heavily trafficked. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention big cat species such as tigers, uh, leopards, lions, etc. But one sad fact that I've learned while working in this job is that every species is poached and trafficked. There's really nothing that's safe anymore. So freshwater mm. turtles and tortoises are mm. trafficked at astonishing rates and really reaping enormous proceeds mm. for organized crime. Mm -hmm. In addition, there's a massive bird trade. So whether it's macaws from Latin America or songbirds from mm. Southeast Asia, they're really being pulled out of the forest at alarming rates. And if I could take a moment just to share a personal story on that yeah, note, please. I went to a national park in uh, Indonesia, and this was a rainforest. It's what you think of as a tropical rainforest, dense, dense foliage, very lush. And in the three days I was in that forest, we did not hear one single bird in three days. Because what they do is the poachers go in with these giant nets and they take the birds out by the tens of thousands for the illegal pet trade. And the problem is, of course, when you're taking species out at that quantity, not only can the species not survive, but again, we are reaping enormous profits for organized crime. And that's really what is happening with this trade is we're moving towards silent forests where there's nothing left. And mm. so that's why I feel as though the work the State Department doing is so timely and so important because all of these species are running out of time. Mm. So here's another question that I'm, that's from Jen. I'm gonna kind of condense it 
because it kind of goes along with what you're saying, which is because Rowena talked about sort of this is a national security issue, not only for our health because of any kind of virus, but also the money that's made from these trafficked animals goes into corruption, uh, you know, corruption in all ways. And so that's not good for us at all. But what can we do? What can you tell the people here in the United States, anybody, any of us consumers, how can you empower us to be aware of this? And what can we do from where we sit to make sure that this is still remains the issue that it is important? So thanks. Um, thanks for that question. Um, and this actually lets me add something on to what Leslie was talking about um, with the, the most trafficked species. A lot of times what is trafficked is um, something that we, we don't already know about. So there's been so much awareness about um, rhino horn and, and tiger skins and um, ivory. And so those things are things that people might say, hey, that, that's illegal and that's really bad. But a lot of things, um, there was a big case that the US government did tremendous amounts of work on, on eels, on eel trafficking. And so things like amphibians and reptiles and corals and small mammals that maybe nobody's paying attention to, um, there's a lot of uh, trafficking in these things as well. So I think as for citizens to know um, what, you know, to ask questions, to be aware that a lot of things are illegal, that, that when they're traveling, so that there used to be a, a while ago, there was something called buyer beware that was a US, uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service campaign on know what you're buying. I think being just aware of this issue as a, a serious transnational organized crime, not, not something to assume that it's cute and kind of funny or that, you know, um, oh, what are they going to do with that monkey or that bird? Uh, I believe there was there was an article a, a while back in National Geographic about, um, Leslie was mentioning tourism and how important tourism is important for, but really she was referring to natural habitats and ecotourism, whereas there is the whole um, trade, uh, there's a whole tourism with wildlife. So go get your picture taken with the tiger, even though they're all illegal and they shouldn't be breeding them and you shouldn't be taking your photo with, with them. Or so things like that, that are interfacing with wildlife that it might seem like it's okay, but there might be a whole level of illegality to it. So I think being, being involved and caring about these issues um, is going to draw you to all kinds of inspirations for how what you can find out more about. As mentioned, it's very complicated. There's so many different areas, so many different species. So people can get involved in all kinds of different ways, whether it's policy or private sector efforts. Excellent. Awesome. Um, this is a good question. Just came in. Do either of you have a particularly vibrant example of a specific case or incident you experienced? or that a colleague experienced in the foreign field. Leslie, you want to go first since I just talked so much? Um, so uh, for INL, we are not, I am not a law enforcement officer. So unfortunately, mm -hmm. I do not have firsthand experience with um, investigating a case. But one thing I can talk about um, that I thought was really exciting, one of the programs we have been running, this is a global program, is working with law enforcement officers to use um, digital forensics. So what this means is when somebody comes across a seizure or they make an arrest, everybody has a, a cell phone with them, a mobile phone, or maybe they have a laptop. This was taking law enforcement officers, folks who don't normally work in the technology field, teaching them how to take apart a computer and figure out what are the really important bits of that computer or that mobile device to investigate the crime. So if you look on your mobile device, you've got contact lists, right? And who did they recently text? Talk to. And so to be able to observe and fund this training where we're giving law enforcement officers really hands-on experience on what they can do, real techniques so that next time they go and make that arrest, they know exactly where to go into that criminal's mobile phone. It's not a direct answer to your question about an, a specific case, but I do think it is an example of the type of work we do in INL and how we're really 
training and empowering these other agencies overseas to do the work themselves so that they're able to more effectively combat wildlife crime. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Rowena? So, so the question was a, sort of a favorite story. Yeah, story from the field, yeah, or something you experienced. So I think I thought of a broader, upon reflection, I thought of a broader example, which is that I go to these international meetings and um, work on combating wildlife trafficking and try to get um, language on combating wildlife trafficking into these policies and things like the, the, um, the, the CCPCJ, the, the Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice, or the OECD, um, or uh, APEC or ASEAN, you know, these big fora. And I think what I've seen over the years through um, the State Department's work and our interagency work is we have made so much progress in getting this level, the, the level of interest and understanding, right, the bar is really raised high on where this crime sits that we are, this topic is, there's so much action and so much um, attention being, being put to combating wildlife trafficking. It's not seen like, oh, that's kind of a weird issue or, oh, that's kind of different or really, you know, it, it is absolutely, it's important. It is serious crime. So with all the confiscations, with all these busts, with all the, the media reports, with all of the USG funding for training and, and INL's programs and other programs from USAID and Fish and Wildlife Service and all of the work that the USG does in other countries as well, that this issue now, when we go to these international meetings, this is a serious topic. We are going to talk about it. We're going to work on it. We're going to get something serious done. We're not just going to write something kind of nice, like maybe we'll think about it. And so that has been really rewarding for me for working in this field for several years. And I think I'm, I mean, and so I'm very grateful to be part right. of the State Department at this time when we've made so much progress in the international community and being in a, in a very um, forward leaning country. Right. So it sounds like it's up there with the other trafficked human drugs. It's, it's, it's just, it's mentioned. That's right. Yeah. It's frequently mentioned. I mean, very different um, uh, sure. in implementing sometimes, sometimes not, but that's right. It's taken very seriously. Right. We are talking about it and it is not just on the margins. It is, it is being, it has a lot of attention and awesome. uh, yeah. It gives me so, a lot of hope. Yeah, so as we wrap up and as we, you know, and I know we have a lot of students that we engage with and work with and, you know, obviously this, you've, gave, you've both given us just a tremendous look into this issue and what's involved on the policy and enforcement side and it can get very technical. Um, so there's a lot to learn, but if you had to name some skills, some skills of diplomacy that you use in your work whether it's working within your office or working with our international, your international partners, what would some of those skills be that you would suggest to some students to, to think about practicing and to, to, and to learn about? Hmm. Okay, so skills for students. Um, let's see, I think that honestly, our skills are, are the same as, as other State Department negotiating and diplomacy skills. So um, a lot of ground truthing, working um, within with your partners on making sure that your policies, that you understand your different policies and the implications. So your skills would be um, research about policies, research about ground truthing, what you're working on, negotiating skills, right? As, as we were mentioning earlier, and Leslie was talking about different things are important to different countries, understanding your context, right? So the geopolitical context of what's important in that country, are they really invested in their wildlife? So they're going to darn what they're super going to care about this? Um, or, you know, do they have something that's going extinct and they want you to be quiet about it? Um, but a lot of countries do care about their wildlife species. So there's national pride to appeal to. Um, so I think that having an interest in the, the countries and doing your homework on that mm -hmm. and working with the right partners and being well informed and then negotiating skills. I love it. Thank you. Leslie, anything to add to that? Yeah, the only other thing I would say and, and capitalizing on what Rowena said, 
I think communication skills are really critical for the work that we do. And by that, I mean, not just your verbal communication skills, as Rowena said, you know, we do have to negotiate and have those conversations, but also your writing skills are extremely important. We do a lot of writing in our job and reviewing other people's papers. And so really having strong writing skills where you're able to write for a wide variety of audiences could be a very technical paper, something that's mm -hmm. very um, scientific or very policy oriented. But sometimes we also write uh, materials for people that don't have a background in this. And so to be able to translate some of that very technical information into more plain English is also a skill that I think is greatly valued at the State Department. So all those different types of communication skills are really important if you're looking at a career in this field. Awesome. Thank you both so very much for your time and for exploring this issue for all of all of those listening, and I think all of those listening would, uh, listening would also want to offer you their thanks for working on this issue and being committed. Um, this is a national security issue, as you said, and so I just thank you for your work and your service to the State Department and helping keep this country safe. So thank you so much. Thank you to all of you watching. Um, please, you know, follow us on our social media's uh, handles so you can continue to watch further programs. And Leslie, Rowena, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank Great. you. Bye. Thank you so much. All right. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye.